In the drowsy days between... Even those who are not away are usually thinking more of play than of study. But the love of learning that animates the classroom is never really absent, even when the room is temporarily taken over by the painters and plasterers. Wherever two or three are gathered together, there you will find the play of man's restless intellect among the great ideas. Listen, any American can beat any ten Frenchmen. The trouble with the French race is they're all too excitable. It's in their blood. You know, the Latin temperament. And I ought to know my sister's married to one. Oh, no! That's absolutely wrong. Oh, yeah? What's wrong? What's wrong? Everything. A, there is no French race. B, there is no Latin temperament. C, the people who speak the Latin languages are neither all excitable nor all anything. D, behavior is not simply a matter of heredity. E, heredity is not in the blood. F, the fact that you happen to know one specimen of anything is no evidence that other specimens are the same. Please, remain where you are. I'll explain. May I have your attention here uh, at the board again? To begin with, there is no French race. As a matter of fact, it's not easy to state just what a race is. The most widely accepted modern definition says it is a group of people with certain physical traits in common based on a common heredity. The question is, which traits? Once upon a time, the answer seemed obvious, skin color. Today, we know this classification doesn't work at all because skin coloring may shade off continuously from light to dark within a single biological group so that there was no point at which we could say one race ended and another began. As a result, many individuals didn't have the right coloring to go with their alleged race. For example, you could find plenty of members of the so-called brown race who were actually lighter than some members of the so-called white race, and so on. So you see, classification of man into five races based on skin color wasn't at all satisfactory. In attempting to find a better classification, Modern anthropologists have turned to more reliable traits, such as body build, cephalic index, nasal index, facial structure, eye color, color and texture of the hair. One racial classification based on such traits and widely used today lists three major races, Caucasian, Mongoloid, and Negroid, plus a doubtful category for those that don't seem to fit anywhere else. These are further divided into 15 sub-races. But even with this classification, we run into difficulty, which we can see by considering the characteristics of three of the sub-races within the Caucasian group. We know, of course, which traits are supposed to belong to each of these sub-races. The Alpine, the Mediterranean, a narrow head, medium to short stature, and dark brown or black hair. The Nordic has a narrow head, tall stature, and blonde hair. However, the more we study these things, the less simple they become. These various traits refuse to stay put. For example, we find individuals with the short, stocky body of the Mediterranean, the round skull of the Alpine, and the blonde hair coloring of the Nordic. Nature, apparently unimpressed by our earnest efforts at classification, creates such wrong combinations by the millions in every part of the world. 
The biological concept of race, gentlemen, cannot be applied to individuals as simply as is popularly believed. But no matter what classification you apply, if the word race means an inherited physical type, then almost every existing nation would include not just one race, but many races. The French nation, for example, includes Nordics, Alpines, and Mediterraneans. The percentage is varying as you move from one part of the country to another. In short, a nation is not a race. There is no such thing as the French race, any more than there is an English race, German race, or American race. Neither is there any such thing as a specific Latin temperament. The word Latin refers only to a group of languages spoken by various countries whose populations may or may not resemble each other in other ways. Actually, a sampling of the peoples who speak the Latin tongues would turn up a very wide range of behavior patterns differing sharply from nation to nation. Such a sampling would have to include not only the people of France, but also of Romania, Spain, Italy, Portugal, South and Central America, Mexico, and Cuba. People in all these countries speak the Latin languages, yet their behavior differs widely from country to country. Therefore, all people who speak the Latin tongues are not all excitable, nor all anything. And now for the major fallacy, the belief that group differences in behavior are the result of heredity. Down through the ages, people have more or less taken it for granted that a Japanese child, for example, inherits his distinctive behavior, his gestures, his manners, his attitudes toward life, just as he inherits the color of his eyes and the shape of his nose. This belief, which has had an important and sometimes an unfortunate influence on human relations, was not confined to the uneducated. English literature, including the best of Shakespeare, is full of references to English blood and noble ancestry as supposedly decisive factors in determining noble behavior. Now let's look at the scientific evidence. In modern times, many hundreds of careful studies have been made to test this theory that group differences in behavior are hereditary. Yet in all the books and articles that have been published describing these studies to date, not one shred of positive evidence in favor of the theory has ever been reported. On the contrary, a great deal of evidence has accumulated which shows that people acquire their behavior as they acquire their speech from the culture they grow up in. It isn't easy to carry out scientific experiments in the field of group differences. <laughs> As a rule, the most we can do is to study and observe, as this anthropologist is doing with a group of South Sea Island children. However, an experiment of sorts was made, quite unintentionally, but on an enormous scale in the 18th and 19th centuries. A large number of West Africans was forcibly uprooted from their own culture and set down 3,000 miles away in a totally different culture. Some of the folk ways these African tribesmen brought with them have persisted. Influencing our culture in various ways. But despite many factors tending to perpetuate the African group as a group, a number of their descendants are today indistinguishable from Americans of other stocks, except by their physical appearance. Obviously, these people would be no more at home in an African village than their tribal ancestors would have been in an operating room. In short, so far as we can tell now, group differences in behavior are the result of learning, 
not heredity. And, of course, biologists today know that the physical traits that distinguish one race from another are not transmitted by the blood, but by the genes. Many fallacies about group differences can be traced to the bad habit of generalizing from selected cases. This young man notices how excitable his French brother-in-law is, but conveniently forgets the millions of French people he's never met. The behavior of isolated cases should not be overgeneralized to represent the behavior of a group. I... Just a moment, young man. I have a feeling there was one more fallacy in your statement. All I said was one American can beat ten Frenchmen. At what? Well, at anything. Baseball. Ah, yes, that was it. Thank you. The fallacy of the ethnocentered criterion. The which? Well, let me put it this way. Would you care to bet a week's pay you could beat 10 Frenchmen at, uh, let us say, fencing? You see, Bill, a skill typical of one culture is not a proper yardstick for general comparisons between cultures. Now then, let's take another look at these fallacies we've been discussing. A, a nation is not a race, for any nation includes many inherited physical types. B, there is no such thing as a Latin temperament, for the behavior of the people in the various Latin-speaking countries varies widely from country to country. C, people who speak these Latin tongues are never all excitable or all anything, nor are the members of any group. D, group differences in behavior are the results of learning, not heredity. E, hereditary traits are transmitted not by the blood, but by the genes. F, the behavior of isolated cases should not be overgeneralized to represent the behavior of everyone in a group. And finally, a skill typical of one culture is never a proper yardstick for general comparisons between cultures. Now, let me leave you with just one more thought. Many popular notions about races, heredity, and group differences are completely wrong when they are not completely meaningless. But the trouble is, when it comes to human relations, most of us tend to cherish beliefs and ignore facts. I don't care what the guy said. I still say one American can lick any ten Frenchmen. See what I mean? <laughs>